storytelling is an age old art form. And I, for one, love stories. I love sitting with my grandparents and listening to their stories. I love sitting with my niece and nephew and telling them stories. I talk to my dog and tell her stories. <laughs> We are going to meet the man who is teaching everyone how to tell better stories. He's also called the pitch whisperer because, of course, there's better selling through storytelling. But I believe storytelling is inherent in everything we do. John Livesey, thank you so much for joining us. I can't wait to hear all the tips and tricks and, and all the specialties that we can learn about how to tell better stories and be better success, more successful in all that we do. So thank you for being here. It's great to be with you and Amy. Thanks for having me. Thank you. It's, it's really a pleasure to have you on the show. And um, one of the things that I was initially super interested in was your TEDx talk mm. on being the lifeguard of your own life. Can you give us a little bit of a background about that? Yes, I gave that TEDx talk pre-COVID and it's all about embracing disruption. And so ironically now, it's even more relevant than it was when I gave it. And I think we all realize now that we're gonna be disrupted at one point in our life. Mm -hmm. And how we handle that really shows how we're gonna deal with it. Mm -hmm. And uh, being a former lifeguard, the training I got of not panicking and staying calm when someone's drowning uh, is something that's helped me my entire career, including dealing with this situation that we're all experiencing now. So that was the thread of, wow, what lessons can I learn? How can I get out of my comfort zone? And the bigger story is who we are as a person, our identity is bigger than any one thing happening to us at any one time. Mm, so true. That is so true. And, and how do you loop that into storytelling and the stories that you tell yourself and the stories that you tell others? Well, I always think of ourselves as the director of our own movie. Mm -hmm. And if we're playing a horror movie out in our head, so many times we do that. <laughs> what if this happens? And what if that happens? And, mm -hmm. oh, right? Or we are reliving the past. Somebody said something that hurt our feelings or made us mad. And we keep playing that in loop. And so yeah. my tip is, Think of yourself as the director of your own movie, and you can yell cut at any time. You mm -hmm. can recast the movie. You can change the location. You're in charge. You're the thinker thinking the thoughts. Don't let your thoughts run the movie projector. I, that's so valuable. I love that analogy. It's, it's brilliant, actually. And Thanks. So my, uh, my doctorate is in organizational communication. Mm -hmm. and just diving deep here. But um, one of the things that... Uh, we always said was your perception of reality <laughs> is a deflection of one reality and an acceptance of another because we have too many sensory experiences going through our like right so yes. like you can have the same set and depending on whether you look at one side you can have mm -hmm. the horror movie or mm -hmm. on the other side you can have the action-packed adventure right and you've got the same set and the same props and the same cast. And to me, that's been really valuable because I feel the same way that you do when things happen in your life. You know, how you tell that story to yourself and others just makes all the difference. So I'm just, I'm hundred percent with you. Oh, thanks. Well, it's a lot like the matrix, isn't it? You know, we all have to decide which reality we're living in and we're yeah. now in a virtual reality and getting in the virtual door is very different than getting an appointment face to face and your skills are different. And so embracing all that change all is about what stories am I telling myself? Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people struggle with perfectionism, mm -hmm. especially when they're trying something new. Mm -hmm. um, and I tell people, let's let that go and embrace being a progressionist. Mm -hmm. And a progressionist I define as someone who celebrates progress. So to your analogy, Amy, if you're climbing Mount Everest and you're halfway up in a business situation, a goal or whatever yeah. you're doing, you have a choice halfway up. You can look back and go, wow, look how much progress we've made. Mm -hmm. Or you can look up and go, oh, look how much further we have. <laughs> <Where> to go. <laughs> and maybe it changes depending on the day and how much sleep you've had the night before, right? Oh, yes. <laughs> Self-care is everything. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you had the opportunity to meet with some amazing perfectionists, actually, and take away some of their lessons. One story I recall you sharing which I think our viewers would love to know is you've met Michael Phelps talk about perfection. Yes. And he taught you a pretty good lesson. He did. Well, the way I 
met him as I was selling advertising for a fashion magazine and Speedo was in my territory in Southern California. And I went to them when they were launching a sports line and I said, would you ever consider running an ad for that in a fashion magazine? And they said, no, we're running in a sports fitness magazine. And then I said two magic words that I'd love everyone to take away. What if, when you start a sentence like that, it taps into the right brain where imagination and storytelling lives and people buy emotionally. So whoever tells the best story is the one that gets the yes or the sale. And I said, what if we treated your sportswear like it was in fact high fashion? We could have a swimming pool fashion show, the models walk over a bridge. You could invite Michael Phelps since he's on your payroll as a spokesperson. They love the idea. I got the advertising sale and I got to meet Michael Phelps. And as a former lifeguard, you can imagine how thrilling that was. Amazing. And I said to him, Michael, everyone says you're so successful because you've got feet like fins and your lung capacity is bigger than the average person. I'm guessing there's something else. And he said, oh yes, John, when I was younger, my coach said to me, Michael, are you willing to work out on Sundays? Yes, coach. Great, we just got 52 more workouts in a year than your competition. So my takeaway from that is for all of us to ask ourselves, if we want to be an Olympian-like champion in whatever our field is, what are we willing to do that our competition isn't? Or even more, what are we willing to do that the competition hasn't thought to do? Mm -hmm. Wow, that's a great story. I really like that. And it's true. I think there, there's so much to that, that hard work as well as that you know, positive attitude. And I love, I've never heard anyone say I'm a progressionist instead of a perfectionist. I'm going <laughs> to use that from now on. I love right. that. But I use that. I use that since I've heard it from you. I use that with the kids. Love it. Because yeah, it keeps my, going. my niece is one who will say, no, no, it's going to take me forever to get this done. Mm -hmm. But look how much you've already invested. Mm -hmm. You know, so what if it takes a little longer? Look what you're going to have in the end. I mean, literally, I have been tapping all of my friends who are incredible geniuses <laughs> to, to look for any little extra and, and really the business savvy of it. I mean, it works on every level. It, it can work for kids. It works for us mm -hmm. in business. It, it really has no barriers, which is where stories come in, too. So how yes. did you get into all this? Well, I worked for an ad agency many years ago creating commercials for movies, and boy, that's a great way to learn how to tell a story. You've got a two hour movie and you got to boil it down to 30 seconds to intrigue people enough to want to go see it without giving away the ending. And how you told whatever, like you were saying earlier, Amy, what perspective you're looking at. Is mm -hmm. this the comedy? Is it an action movie? And so I learned that. And then, you know, I was calling on advertisers uh, like Lexus and they would have a media day. And, you know, they would look at, I don't know, 25 different titles narrow it down to 10 and say, we're going to pick three. You each come in for half an hour and don't tell us numbers. We've already researched that. And I went, oh, we have to tell a story. Mm. That's what they're looking for because people buy emotionally and then back it up with logic. You know, the big myth is everyone, we've heard this for years. Oh, you got to get people to know, like, and trust you. you know? And so the belief causes behavior that says, well, if you have to know me, let me just push out a bunch of information. Yeah, let me Who I am, my company, my product, right? And that's not how we buy. Mm -hmm. So I flip it and say, you got to get people to trust you first. That's a gut thing. Mm -hmm. In fact, the handshake came about to show we didn't have a weapon in our hand. Remember when we used to shake hands? <laughs> um, back in the day. Back in the day. Way um, back when in March. <laughs> <laughs> March. <laughs> and, um, and then it goes from the gut to the heart. Do I like you? Yeah. The more we increase our empathy, the more likable we are. Doctors spend more time with patients. Teachers spend more time with students they like. Mm -hmm. And then from the gut to the heart, then it goes to the head. But then again, it's all about what's the story? If people's unspoken question is, will this work for me? Mm -hmm. and so if you're not telling a story of someone else you've helped, that they can't see themselves in that story, they're not going to buy. Yeah, that's interesting. That's what Aristotle said 2,000 years ago with his ethos, pathos, logos that we all had to do in school, right? <laughs> and it's all about it's all about that emotional connection and yes. uh, being able to be being able to be trustworthy. Um, now that you you know now that you've moved on and you're doing you know sales leadership um, on your website, I I saw ridiculously awesome logos like coca-cola giving you testimonials yeah. and cross so what tips do you have for us 
um, on how we can tell better stories for ourselves in our lives and also in our work. Well, when it comes to your uh, career, there's a, it's all about having a great elevator pitch. And the mistake most people make is they think it's an invitation for a 10 minute monologue. Mm-hmm. And we know that's not the case. <laughs> the whole goal of the pitch is to get the second date, gotcha. to intrigue people enough to say, oh, that's interesting, tell me more. Yeah. So an, if you think of an elevator pitch as a short little story and make it conversational mm-hmm. and then give people something like, oh, you know how salespeople struggle to not be seen as a commodity? I'm the pitch whisperer. And companies bring me in to teach their team how to turn boring case studies into case stories. And when that happens, they become revenue rock stars. Mm-hmm. So that's, it's that short, but the structure of it is opening with a conversation, you know how, and I'm mm-hmm. talking about who I help first, and then use the word struggle to define their problem. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, by saying pitch people like, wait, I know what a dog whisperer is, or what's a pitch whisperer? Um, or, wow, that's an outcome I like my team to have revenue rock stars. So it's just enough to ask make them think, oh, I want to know more about something you said. So Mm -hmm. remember, stories have a beginning, middle, and end. So just intrigue people enough to keep the conversation going. Mm -hmm. That's wonderful advice. Wonderful advice. And then just as a final, you know, COVID, COVID tip, what can we do to tell good stories? And how do we pull the good stories out in our own lives and in the world around us? Well, you know, during this situation, you, storytelling is even more important because you don't, have the ability to see people face to face and read body language and a lot of people are on mute so you've got to have stories that pull people in and the secret to a good story is that there's a little bit of drama in it and so mm-hmm. if you can turn um what you just des- the work you do into describing something where people are sitting up on the edge of their feet wondering what's going to happen and then you resolve it and then talk about what life is like after you've worked with somebody that resolution to a story is the secret sauce to a great story Mm -hmm. Hopefully illustrate the change and the result. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, I've got a real quick example. I was working with a healthcare tech company um, and they said, what are you saying? Oh, well, our equipment makes the surgeries go 30% faster. I go, there's no story. So now she says, oh, imagine how happy Dr. Higgins was down at Long Beach Memorial last year using our equipment. And he could go out to the patient's family in the waiting room where every minute feels like an hour and tell them an hour earlier than expected that the loved one did not have cancer from the scope. And the doctor turned to me and said, God, that's, I lived for those moments. That's why I became a doctor. Mm -hmm. Now that salesperson tells that story to another doctor. He sees himself in the story, he or she, she, and says, well, that's why I became a doctor. I want your equipment. Mm -hmm. And with parents, instead of asking your child, how was school? You get one word answers. Okay, fine. Ask, tell, ask your child this question. Was, tell me a story about the best part of your day. Then your child can decide, is it the beginning? Is it the middle or the end of my day? And then you share a story of the best part of your day. And if your child jumps in and like, you can start to teach, what, was this today? Where was this? What time? Start teaching them the elements of a good story. Yeah, I love that. <laughs> totally. that is, that's such a great, we do highlights and lowlights sometimes. Mm-hmm. That That is kind of the same thing as what you're talking about, where they're like, they have to sit there and think, and they're like, Hmm, what was my highlight? What was my low light? And sometimes when they're in middle school, they don't want to play along with you. No, but, but, but if you get it out of highlights, low lights and go, well, storytelling is a skill you're going to need. So yeah. and I'm going to tell you a story of the best part of my day. And so, you know, let's yeah. um, work on that. <laughs> That's my favorite question is what was the best part of your day? And then listening for that answer. So yeah, I, I don't, generally think about sharing the best part of my day with them. <laughs> I'm so oh, it's, it's really <laughs> helpful because then they get to hear how to tell a good story at the same time. Mm-hmm. And then it becomes, it's not you grilling them. It's a shared experience at a meal or whatever, now that we're all quarantining together. So it, um, it makes them feel like this is just what we do in this family. We all tell stories. I love that. I love that. Thank awesome. you so much. My pleasure. <laughs> How can people learn more? Where can they find you? Oh, um, if you can't remember Better Selling Through Storytelling, my book, or my name, johnlivesay.com, just Google the Pitch Whisperer and all my content will show up. Excellent. I know people are going to be looking for you because goodness knows a good story is hard to find. And those (laughs) who can tell it, 
are more memorable in the end. Thank you for sharing with us. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much for that.